I'm happy to see this man back in Heidelberg. Uh, two years ago, um, he gave one of the, at the time, I think best talks at Troopers, maybe even best talks ever. And uh, there is a guy called uh, Dominic White from the UK, who before that, after he had seen an early version of this, uh, publicly stated this is going to be one of the best talks of the year at any security conference. So there is high expectations again. <laughs> Good to see you back and uh, uh, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Eno. Uh, thank you for having me back and no pressure. <laughs> and just a, a little bit about myself. Um, last time I was at, at Troopers, I was uh, on the red team. I was actually presenting in a defense, defensive track. This time I've moved across to more of a defensive role, and I'm presenting in the attack track, so quite interesting. Um, I work at Heroku, or technically Salesforce, and my day job is herding containers. So I look after our container services and make sure that these containers are running in a multi-tenant environment in a secure way. And that's, that's more or less how this talk came up. So what this talk is about is looking at your build pipeline, and more specifically, the source code downloaders that are involved in that build pipeline. Um, what, I, what I'm going to talk about is how, do you, how can you secure this pipeline? What are some of the attacks that can happen when you think you are only downloading source code? Um, I, I really want to emphasize the attacks focus on the download process of that source code, not afterwards once the source code's been downloaded. Yes, we, we, we know you can run scripts in a build environment. That's what build environments are meant to do. This is actually during that source code retrieval phase. We're not expecting code execution. What I'm not going to talk about are some of the other aspects of securing your build pipeline. So things like maintaining positive control of your repositories. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to enable signed git commits uh, or how to manage access control to your git repositories, et cetera. The talk came about looking at our infrastructure at Heroku. So we lovingly refer to our service as remote code execution as a service. You provide us with code, and we'll run it for you. So platform as a service, you only need to be able to code an application. We take care of the infrastructure that actually supports us. So the, the, ser the web server, your, your database servers, your, your routing, et cetera, et cetera. And the way we do this is using essentially infrastructure as code. And this is something that has become really popular in the industry now with DevOps and Sec DevOps is to use infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code simply allows you to define your infrastructure and all the related resources in flat text files or flat source code files. Check that into a version control system. That way you can see who's made changes, uh, what changes have been made, and you can easily roll back from those changes. And what this has meant is all our build pipelines or our infrastructure's code pipelines are kind of converging onto a single type of model that is narrowing and producing a single point of failure. So if, when I looked at this, I saw your source code control as a single point of failure. There's a lot of research that's been done into hey, you need to make sure your Git server is secure. You need to know who is checking in code um, and that they're authorized to do that. But there's no research really looking into what happens after that. What happens after the fact that code has been checked in and now it's being turned into infrastructure or it's being turned into an application. And if you start looking at your infrastructure's code, one of the single points of failure that I identified is Git. So you've got other version control systems, yes, and they are used in your build pipelines and in your infrastructure as code pipelines, but more and more people are moving towards Git. And I, I, I know a lot of players such as GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, they've played a central role in this because they've made it really easy for you to store your source code and manage it with their services. The thing about Git or the Git protocol is it is quite complex. So you've got your Merkle trees and, and this provides a SHA-1 hash of all the, the code that's been checked in and the changes and the commit histories, et cetera. And as a, a, source, as a, a tool creator, I don't want to have to implement the Git protocol because it is complicated. So what you find is a lot of source code downloaders or a lot of tools that interact with source code simply rely on the Git binary that's already present on the system. 
If it's not present, it specifies it as a dependency. And because most systems are using Git now, it, it kind of has become ubiquitous and it, it is present on most servers. What this means is if a vulnerability exists in Git itself, all the tools that rely on Git are immediately affected or are likely affected by this vulnerability as well. So a really simplified version of your build pipeline or this infrastructure as code pipeline is you normally have your source control, so this is your, your Git server or your version control server. All the engineers check in the, the code or the changes that they've, that they've made to this code. As soon as that happens, you can have build triggers. Those triggers tell the build server to either fetch the code or the code is transferred to the build server. Your build scripts run, and more and more these build scripts are running in container environments. So you'll have a Docker container that runs, or you've got a Kubernetes setup and automatic, automatic builds that t just look for a Docker file or a build.yaml. I think we've all seen these before. Once it's gone through the build process, it gets released. So either gets released as infrastructure or gets released as an application onto a, a server um, and run for you. Now, this attack that I, or the attack scenario that I, I found and, and looked into was kind of over here. So just before your build scripts get triggered, when that code is, is downloaded from your source control, um, we get our code execution. So what would this actually look like? So last year, looking into Git and um, how, it, how it works, I came, came across this vulnerability, uh, CVE 2018-11235, and it allows you to get code execution during the Git clone uh, process. So there's one prerequisite. You need to clone your rep uh, repositories as recursive, or you can clone them and then afterwards initialize submodules um, and when the submodules are initialized, the vulnerability triggers as well. So what would this actually look like? So what I've got here is I've just set up a, a reverse shell that, that's gonna receive our connection back. I'm not gonna explain that, um, but what we've also got is we've got a vulnerable version of Git. So in this case, I think it's uh, 2.14.3 and we are simply gonna clone a Git repository. And the clone happens, and if you look at that output, that is normal Git clone when you've got a sub-module sub included that happens. Uh, if you are paying attention, you might notice the directory traversal there. But most end users or automated systems aren't gonna notice the directory traversal there. Um, and what, what's actually happened in the background is if we switch over to our reverse shell, we've got a, a connection back, and this is running as the user, um, well, running in the context of that um, Git, Git user. From, from the user perspective, we've just cloned a repository. If we simply go look in the repository, there's nothing overtly malicious. If we look into it a bit more, you see there's a fake Git uh, directory, but I could be more sneaky and hide that away or actually just get rid of it once the code execution has occurred. And the thing, important thing to note is that fake git directory is actually a git repository in itself. And what this means is it allows us to use the features built into git to get code execution. How does this work? So Git submodules. Git submodules allow you to. Uh, why is it not going? Sorry. So Git submodules allow you to embed repositories within each other. This means that if you've got a dependency that relies on another Git repository, but you don't want to have to ship the source code along in your Git repository, you simply include the external repository as a submodule. What happens during the Git clone process, Git will see that there's a submodule or more than one submodule, and it'll automatically clone those repositories for you, set everything up to be on the correct branches, et cetera, and take care of your dependency management. 
Now, if you look at how these submodules are structured on, on, your, on, on the file system or in the file system, so you've got your, your typical Git repository and got your Git directory. This is where all your Git history and your configs, et cetera, live. Uh, so you've got your config, and then you've got this, this folder called modules. Inside the modules, you've got each sub-module as another Git repository. So you've got Git, Git repositories inside Git repositories, and the actual code that we control lives in your Git uh, repository. So as an attacker, if we could control either the .git directory or the submodules uh, directory, we could theoretically get code execution through, through the Git protocol. So Git protects against this. It doesn't allow you to check in a .git directory. Um, there have been vulnerabilities in the past where you could do this, especially on case insensitive file systems. So if you made a .git with a cap, uh, all in caps, that would actually get checked into the repository and then on Windows or Mac OS, you could actually code execution through that. Um, so they're protected against that. Now, if you look at how the submodules get created, you might notice it says modules, submod. Where does that name for the submodule come from? Where does that path get constructed from? So that path is actually defined in your .git modules file. So the file takes a normal git config uh, layout, you define your submodule. So in the submodule, we've called it submodule 11235. That is a submodule's name. The submodule's got a path. So where in the repository is it going to be cloned into? So it's just a, a file, a, a folder in your repository, and then a URL where it should be collected or fetched from. In this case, we're just fetching from GitHub. Now, that submodule name over there is simply appended to the path of your git directory slash modules folder. And that is where the vulnerability comes in. Because if we can specify a directory traversal, now we can get git to, to look in a location that we control for, um, for the git configuration information, and we can get code execution. Unfortunately, it isn't that simple and might be one of the reasons why this bug has been overlooked in the past. So if you just use a directory traversal to try and get code execution, what will happen is Git will create your initial repository, then it will do the Git clone for your submodules. It will go along and say, okay, this is the first submodule I'm cloning. It will check the path and go, oh, there's code here already, or there's a Git repository already. This is not right. This is the first submodule. This is initting. There shouldn't be anything here, and it will just delete the contents over there. So when I was doing this research, I got up until this point. So I had this, and I was banging my head against this for ages. I was trying symlinks. Um, I was trying different traversals. You can actually traverse completely out of the, the Git repository, and all I could do was delete files on the file system. So if you're stupid and you run git as root, I could delete your root file system, but eh, as an attacker, that's not really useful. I, I don't want to DOS, I want to get code execution. What actually happens when you've got a second submodule? If that second submodule gets created first, so there's no, um, there are no submodules currently in git directory modules and the submodules uh, name, It'll first create that submodule, and again, another thing I bashed my head, head against for ages is I kept using, uh, I think I had a repository called pew, and the next one I had xyz. So this didn't trigger. What you need is a submodule name that is alphabetically before your malicious submodule. So what will happen is git will create and clone this um, directory, aaaa, and then when it needs to do the subsequent submodule, it'll go, oh, okay, we've in already started initiali initializing submodules. This is expected behavior that a submodule might already contain uh, the Git information. Don't delete it. Use what is there already. And this gives us our code execution. So if we look at what has happened now, we've essentially ended up with this. We've got, uh, we've simply moved our 
fake module from this uncontrolled area into the controlled content. So now we can check in a malicious Git repository inside our Git repository. And when the sequence of Git clones happens, Git will use the contents that is stored in this fake Git directory for us, and we can get code execution. How do you get that code execution? Well, Git is really helpful in the sense. So Git has a concept of hooks. Git hooks can be defined to, uh, to trigger at predefined intervals or uh, depending on which actions Git is currently performing. So you've got a, a pre-commit hook, for example. If you want to prevent specific code from being committed accidentally, you can set a pre-commit hook that will run every time the git commit command executes. The pre-commit hook will fire, it will run the script, check that the commit is fine, and allow it or not allow it. Another hook that exists is this, uh, is this post checkout hook. So the post checkout hook fires exactly as the name suggests as soon as a checkout happens. The reason this is useful for us is when the submodule is, is cloned, Git first does a Git clone of the submodule, then it checks the submodule and which branch the submodule is supposed to be on. Is it supposed to be a master branch or a different branch? And depending on that, it will do a git checkout and try and check out onto the correct branch. So git checkout executes, it spots the, the post checkout script, it executes it for us, and all the code that we have stored in that script will execute. So all in all, quite a simple attack, um, really useful from the perspective of we're not using any memory corruption, we're simply abusing the functionality that's already in Git and a very small in injection bug or more, more logic bug than anything else. So now, one of the very first arguments you'll hear against an attack like this is, sure, but I check my Git repositories. I make sure that the code I'm cloning is the code I'm expecting. Or, well, you're cloning a repository, you're gonna build it and execute it anyway, so someone can just put a backdoor into the code. The thing about this attack is there are a bunch of tools that have a hidden dependency on Git that you, one, might not be expecting that it exists, and two, you're probably not checking the source code for those repositories that rely on Git. Another thing is that submodules are cloned recursively, so I can hide this in a submodule of a submodule of a submodule of a submodule. Unless you're going through every single submodule that's included in a repository, you won't spot this. Your source code analyzers are also not going to spot this because it's not in source code. It is in the directory structure of the Git repository. If you look at all of these tools, when this Git vulnerability came out, you could get a shell through all of these just by running them in their default configuration. The reason for that is because as I mentioned, Git is complicated. So these tools simply shell out to Git and ask it to do a git, git clone dash dash recursive or git clone submodules in it. That is a default behavior of all of these tools. Um, so again, what would an attack like that look like? So if we look at Docker, you can actually get a shell by simply doing a Docker build of a malicious repository. Because Docker relies on Git in the background, you get a shell. Again, same as before, reverse shell listener, and we're just gonna do, um, you're gonna check Docker, latest version of Docker, but the Git, for, uh, Git binary on the back end is outdated. Go to Docker build from the exact same directory or same Git repository as before. So do the Docker build. What Docker now does in the background is it shells out to Git and vulnerability triggers in the background we get a shell in the context of the Docker user, and our Docker build actually succeeds um, once this is complete. Again, the, the way I set up the shell, it, it stopped the Docker execution, but it's just the, the way I did the shell. This is all transparent, quiet in the background, exit code zero, nothing to actually give away that we've got code execution. 
And this goes a long way to addressing the other, other problem that people normally point out with this, with this uh, vulnerability. Um, because Docker, Docker build is simply pulling the code from, the Docker, from a Git repository, you don't expect there to be happening, code execution to be happening outside of the Docker build itself. So when Docker does this, the Docker daemon first does the git clone, get your code execution, and then it sets up the Docker context, then it executes the Docker build, which runs in a container. So maybe in your build environment, you think your builds are happening inside a container, but this code execution happens before that container is actually created. Um, so you've escaped the container before the container existed. Really useful. Now, once I realized that it is possible to trick Git into doing things that you want it to do, um, and I knew that other tools relied on Git in the background, I figured maybe it's possible to combine that and abuse the way that other applications or other tools use Git and the way Git uh, lies files out on the file system. So this brought about the next EVE. So this one is in Go. So when you do a go get dash u, and you point it to a Go package, you end up with code execution. Now, another important thing to note is, and someone called me out on this, they said, yeah, but when you do a go get, there's a, a build that happens anyway, so that, that's code execution, it's, it's expected behavior. The thing that happens that, that you can do is you can do a go get dash u dash d, and with the dash d, it actually says don't build the Go packages. So there is no build step, there is no code execution that is expected. So the vulnerability still triggers, it still works, and you get code execution. Now, now again, what this looks like, it's really simple, just as before. Reverse shell, um, vulnerable version of, of Go, we check out Go version, pretty, pretty recent, but it's vulnerable. Go get you, point it to our a repository hosted on GitHub, um, and as the go get occurs, we have a code execution that happens in the background. Again, this time it paused, again, just because of the type of shell I chose, but again, it's super silent, there's nothing to actually give away, and you can see we actually get dropped inside a Git repository with our shell. Um, if we go across, we can see the go get command executed, there's nothing to alert the user to anything funny, that anything funny has happened, or that the, the Go get failed. From a user perspective, they've downloaded the Go code and they can now use, use that package. Sorry, I don't know why I keep losing the full screen. Yeah. So why does this work? As I mentioned, a lot of tools have a hidden dependency on Git in the background. And if you go and look at your Go packages, um, now prior to Go modules, this is still Go packages. Uh, if you look in your Go path, uh, Go path, you'll see that your source directory, it creates a folder for the package. So our folder, package is github.com, go demo. And if you go into that folder, you'll see you've got a .git directory and your Go source code. So it's, a, it's quite evident that there was just a Git clone that happened. So I had the thought of, what happens when we have a package that's, whose name ends in .git? Will we actually create a folder called .git and be able to reuse that when a second package is, is cloned? Unfortunately, it wasn't as simple as just doing an import like this. Um, if you do try this, you end up creating on, on the file system uh, in your go, go path rev.conch.cloud slash a slash dot git, um, but that's a legitimate package and there's no code execution that, that occurs because git just clones itself into a dot git folder. What you need to do is set up this nested dependencies or nested set of um, go imports. So you start with our target package. So in this case, our target package was that ho one hosted on GitHub, so uh, go troopers demo, and it has a dependency on this package slash a slash dot git. So that, that goes and creates 
this um, folder for us, so we end up with a .git. Now we need to get code into the parent folder, so that the parent folder will use the .git directory that we've just dropped to the disk as its git directory, and we, we can now control uh, code execution. So simply import a new project, another project or package that's just at A, you can see A is a parent of .git, and then you just need to trigger an update, um, and the reason you need to trigger an update is so that you can actually trigger one of these git hooks or one of the other git config options, because otherwise you just have a git clone, and there's no git hook for git clones, or there's no way to actually get code execution just during a git clone, um, other than if you can control a few other, other variables. So what you need to do is you need to do this kind of circular um, import. So if you just have go C try and import itself again, the go, go get process will shout at you and say, you're being stupid, you're trying to do a circular import of a package. You can't do this, it's a cyclical import. But if you break it out into a separate package, you get go C to import to fetch go A, and go A actually has a dependency on go C. When go A gets initialized, it goes, oh, I rely on go C, which lives at this path. It will trigger a git fetch to try and get the latest version of that, that, that package, and it will trigger our exploit, and it also overwrites any content that, that was stored at go C. Um, but we get our code execution. It seemed really straightforward at this point. I thought, okay, we can just set up our Git repositories in the correct order, import them in the correct order, and we should get code execution. Again, not that simple. One, when I was trying to report this vulnerability to, to the Golang team as well, I initially said, oh no, you need to create a custom Git server um, so that you can create these nested Git repositories. Because if you try to do this on something like GitHub or any of the repository providers, they'll see that .git as just a folder and see it as um, not, not legitimate in your repository and won't allow it. Um, so to get around that one limitation and be able to host this vulnerability on a public Git server without requiring the Go team to set up their own server, um, you can use what are called meta imports. So your meta imports simply run as an HTTP service when the go, go get process hits that, that HTTP service, it says, hey, I'm looking for this package. So in this case, it's looking for um, the package rev.com. Um, yeah, so it hits, a, hits this endpoint, so it goes rev.constructcloud. It says, hey, I'm looking for slash a dot get. And the meta import service responds and says, sure, if you're looking for that content, drop it into that location. You fetch it using the Git protocol, and you can actually find it on GitHub living inside this repo. So it just does a, a meta redirect, essentially, for you. The second part of getting this to work was that when go get requests the parent folder, we use the, the meta redirects again. But in this case, we say, hey, when you fetch a content for this parent folder, slash A, you should actually drop it into slash A slash A. And the reason for this is, if you just try and drop it into to slash A, um, during your, if you remember the cyclical imports, you had go C importing go A. When go A gets initialized, uh, get, go get will issue, issue a, git, um, a git command, and that git command will check if there's a, a current checkout of the repository. And it will say, oh no, you've already checked out this repository um, you're trying to import it for a package called go, go C, but it's already checked out for a package called go A. So we're not going to allow this. By adding that extra slash A or slash whatever, it doesn't see that Git repository as existing on disk, and it just proceeds to try and do a Git clone and then all the uh, subsequent steps that you require. So what we end up at, with at this point after the first, um, first import, so this go get the first package, 
it creates a .git directory for us, some Go source code. And if you look inside that git directory, it's actually a git repository itself. So it's got its own git re repo. But it also has all the same contents as what a .git directory will normally have. So if you do git init bare, um, it'll have those same kind of contents. It'll have your, your tracking history, everything that Git expects to be living in the .git directory. We'll actually have some Go source code as well. Um, our malicious script that we're gonna execute, use your Git folders and a config file. Now to get the code execution, initially I was trying to do this using um, the Git hooks again. Unfortunately, none of the Git commands that get executed are ones that trigger a hook. Um, or, yeah, so none of the, the hooks that we need are triggered. The way around this was to use the git config file. So when you set up your git config file, one of the core options is to set a git proxy. What the git proxy says is, hey, if you're cloning a repository or fetching a repository over the git protocol, please execute the script first and proxy all the traffic through standard in, standard out for that script. So easy peasy, we set up our git proxy, we point it to our malicious script that we've dropped to disk, and now we need to tell git to fetch a, fetch a repository over the git protocol. Stumbling block again. So initial report to, to the Go team um, said, hey, this works, but you actually have to run go get with dash dash insecure. The reason for this is when you issue a go get um, command, go along each step of the process, it will check the, the protocol that Git is gonna use for the clone or for the fetch and determines whether it is secure or insecure. It is determined to be secure if it's over HTTPS or SSH, and if it's over Git or just plain HTTP, it gets labeled as insecure and Go shouts at you and says, hey, you don't wanna do this, you wanna use, um, you wanna use secure protocols. I guess you could convince someone to run your Go Git dash you dash dash insecure, but I think most users will balk at the fact that they're running something that says insecure. So I had to find a way around this. The way around this is to use a quirk in the way git config works. So git config allows you to, to specify your config information and to query that. So to query the git config, you just say git config and then the key that you wanna query. So in this case, remote dot origin dot URL. So if you say git config remote dot origin dot URL, it is gonna return the second one. So you can have multiple URLs in there, but the git config command is only gonna return the last one in the list. So go get does this, it goes, hey git, tell me which protocol you're gonna be using for this next operation. It says, oh sure, I'm gonna be using HTTPS. Go get goes, oh that's great, that's secure please proceed. Now when the git fetch command executes, it goes and does this uh, same process internally, it says git config get, but the internal process that git uses returns the first entry. So really not a security vulnerability in itself, but a nice little quirk that when you're trying to make a security decision based on the output or the return from, from the git uh, command, you get two different results and your security decision ends up being wrong. Now, to finally put it all together, the, this is the content of the Puted SH script that's gonna be executed. So we get our code execution, then we need to do a bit of cleanup. Again, first, first report I sent to the Go team, it just ended up bailing out and you got your code execution and then it bailed out and said, oh, I can't carry on with this Git process. Uh, something went wrong along the way. To stop that and to clean up the exploit so that it is invisible to the end user, you need to do some cleanup. So first, you end up doing a git pull just to get the current, the parent folder up to the latest uh, version that's available in git. Then you remove the files that are um, extra in this case. So in this case, I had an extra main.go. And then you need to issue the expected command, which is a, a git pull um, command, but to get the output from the git pull command, you need to, to echo it out of, of a standard in or standard out. 
So you do a git trace packet, which just tells uh, git to output the packets that is uh, being sent and received on to standard out. Unfortunately, that contains a bit of superfluous information to make it easier to read, but breaks the git protocol. So we just do a bit of grep, awk, and uh, to get rid of that and clean up the protocol for us. And that's how we end up with a nice clean exploit. Someone runs go get you, package name, and code execution happens in the background. User is none the wiser, uh, nice clean exploit. Yep. So this is where my presentation hits a bit of a snag. I was really hoping to demonstrate a third vulnerability that relies on Git in the background. Um, unfortunately, the patches aren't out yet for that. They, I was really hoping they were gonna patch this week. Um, so Docker project, there's a vulnerability in Docker build itself. Um, the way it, it interacts with Git, you can get code execution. There should be a patch coming out at the end of this month. Um, so just keep an eye out for it. But I'll be doing a blog post on that. Uh, and the link for that will be up um, in the slides. So yeah, really hoping to get another demo for you, but unfortunately, there isn't one. So what now? How do we actually secure these pipelines? Um, we've got this problem of relying on uh, our tools, relying on the output from our tools to actually make security decisions for us, and those tools are relying on a single point of failure, Git, in the background. How do we secure it? So one is good supply chain management. So this is a really difficult problem. If you look at something like NPM, um, I mentioned NPM is vulnerable to this. And you can go and nest uh, this vulnerability or an exploit for this vulnerability in uh, NPM dependency. And I was reading a, a paper last week where they said NPM universe has 750,000 packages. So how do you securely manage 750,000 packages who could have any number of nested dependencies in them that actually exploit this vulnerability. So from a defensive perspective, it is really difficult to try and manage your supply chain. Um, you can try your best, try and know where your packages are coming from. You can use something like a, a, either a notary service just to, to make sure that the package that you're receiving is the one that you're expecting, or you host your own NPM registry, your own Docker registry, but that gets rid of all this nice DevOps, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, um, world that we now live in, where everything is hosted and run for us externally. That's a really difficult problem to try and solve. Um, one, one nice example of this is Go modules are actually moving towards a module where they can prove that the source code that you download is the source code that you're expecting. So they, they're proposing the use of a notary service. Um, the notary service will actually, once you've done a go get, it was Go will check the, the SHA-256 or the, the signature of the package that's been downloaded or the module that's been downloaded. Contact the notary service, say, hey, I just downloaded this package. This is the signature I get uh, and the hashes for all the files that are downloaded. Is this what is expected? And the notary service will say yay or nay. Um, you might still have ended up with code execution at that point, but at least you know there's no back door in the code that you, you're downloading. Um, Another nice example is when I showed all those tools, I initially had Rust Cargo on the list of tools that are vulnerable to this, this exploit. And the reason for that is um, because Rust Cargo uses Git in the background to, to set up the packages. What I didn't realize is it uses libgit2, the libgit2 library to actually do the Git cloning instead of shelling out to Git. And libgit2 has made a really good security uh, decision to not automatically execute anything like hooks or any external scripts during the, the setup process of a Git repository. That is all up to the end user or the end developer who's using the library to actually do that. So even though libgit2 was vulnerable to the CV2018.11235, it was not exploitable because it, no hooks or no external processes get executed. So that's, that's another option. Look at using secure new implementations of libraries such as libgit2 to, to actually, uh, as a dependency for your source code downloaders or the processes that download your source code. 
Source code should also be fetched in a secure or isolated system. Um, as I mentioned with the, the Docker example, for example, if you're running Docker build and pointing it at a, at a Git repository, that, that fetches and executes your build scripts in, in the same process, in the same environment. And that, that leads, a, leads, into, leads to a problem. If there's a code execution during the, the build, the download phase, your build phase is also compromised. Uh, so you wanna be fetching code in an isolated system, making sure that the, the code hasn't been tainted in any way before you transfer it to your build system that does the, the build process. I've gone a lot quicker than I thought. Well, five minutes quicker than I expected. Um, but I'm, I'm available for questions now. I'm gonna be doing a blog post on the Go vulnerability, putting that up on the Heroku blog most likely. Otherwise, the, the Git vulnerability, I've written it up on my personal blog. Um, and yeah, if there's any questions. Also, all the content, I'll make it available straight after this. Uh, it all, all lives in a Git repository. Um, how meta. Uh, so the, the videos, the slides, with speaker notes and everything is available there. Cool. That's it.